In July 2010, Kylie released her 11th studio album, Aphrodite, a record which was touted as a return to the dance floor after the R&B leanings of body language and the disjointed nature of X. So just how did Aphrodite's lead single come about? And what present did Kylie surprise one of the writers of the song with? Which track was also recorded by Cheryl Cole? Why was the music from Sessions with Red One left off the album? And what song did Kylie later have a hit with that was initially rejected for the record? So many questions, let's find out. Written by husband and wife songwriting duo Jim Elliott and Jemima Stilwell, who had also written Two Hearts. All the Lovers has become a bona fide Kylie classic and a regular addition on Kylie's set list ever since. Speaking to Steve Anderson, such a good feeling podcast, Jim Elliott spoke about where the idea for the song came from. Weirdly, it started as a country song. I remember my car broke down. It was 10 miles from home and I had to walk. I was walking alone, bored out of my mind, and then suddenly you start humming and then suddenly a lyric. So I'd keep singing it to myself all the way home until I got into the studio. It was exciting cause I knew there was something there. And then I heard Kylie's I Believe In You. I guess the template wasn't dissimilar, an emotional thing over an arpeggiated bass line. And Robin was doing it also with every heartbeat. And with Jim giving Kylie a hit single, R. Kyles also ended up giving Jim a present too. On the podcast, the songwriter talked about how he had just moved out to the English countryside and had a very big garden to mow. And when Kylie told him that All The Lovers was going to be the lead single, Jim remarked that hopefully that meant he could buy a new mower for his lawn. Soon after, a brand new giant tractor type lawnmower turned up on his driveway. You see, Kylie really is as lovely and kind as you would imagine her to be. And since the song's release, Kylie's fans have become known as lovers. The track inexplicably only reached number 13 in Australia. How is that even possible? It's brilliant, but fared much better in the UK where it reached number three in July 2010, which was a very busy week and was kept off the top spot by Katy Perry's California Girls and that aeroplane song by somebody called Bob. And the album was launched at Super Club Pasha in the home of dance music Ibiza. According to a number of sources, four different acts wanted to record Get Out Of My Way before it was eventually secured by Kylie. Two of the writers on the song, Daniel Davidson and Peter Valvik, would go on to become long-term collaborators of Kylie, co-writing Sexy Love and Million Miles on Kiss Me Once, Love on Golden and Magic for Disco. Despite the song's enduring popularity among Kylie fans, this was not reflected in the song's chart position at the time, with it only reaching number 12 in the UK. But this was probably more a reflection of shifting industry dynamics rather than the quality of the actual song. In an interview with Perth Now in 2011, Kylie had this to say about the underwhelming performance of the song. I felt a little let down with my releases from Aphrodite. I was caught out like a lot of artists were, with record companies figuring out how to do single releases these days. I remember doing a promo for one of the last singles and it just felt really old fashioned. You get Gaga's Born This Way available on iTunes the day you hear it first. That's how it should be. And there's me waiting for a midweek chart figure like it's 1980. Written by husband and wife songwriting duo Andy Chatterley and Narina Paolo, Better Than Today first appeared on the latter's Buckminster Fuller EP in 2009. According to Classic Pop magazine, it was the first song recorded for the Aphrodite album and it was premiered on Kylie's For You, For Me US tour. Norena had been nominated for her solo work at the Brit Awards and the Ivor Novellos a few years previously. 
With its subtle country influences, it's reminiscent of an early Scissor Sister song. Whilst the track has really grown on me over the years and I'm a fan of it now, at the time I was very surprised to hear it was going to be a single, thinking that the title track was a much more obvious choice. But what do I know? In an interview with the Shropshire Star from 2018, Narina spoke about how she came to write better than today, because her record company at the time were breathing down her neck, her words not mine, to write popular material and it was those songs that led her to working with Kylie. She also spoke about how she is no longer willing to co-write pop songs. I can't say Kylie wasn't good money, it was, but I only saw it as a means to an end, funding my own records. But after a while it became so soul destroying, not necessarily for me, but because all these young artists, they're being filled with all this hope. And you know that unless the second single goes, it's over for them. Put Your Hands Up was written by the Nervo twins from Australia who were both riding high at the time having scored a huge smash in 09 with David Guetta and Kelly Rowland and their dance classic When Love Takes Over. According to an interview with the sisters with the Mew Mew's website, Cheryl Cole also recorded Put Your Hands Up which must have been intended for the album she released later that year, Messy Little Raindrops. But of course the song went to Kylie, perhaps because the Nervo twins were also signed to EMI at the time, who also owned Parlophone. According to an interview with Attitude from 2017, Narina Paolo, who wrote Better Than Today and Aphrodite for the album, also submitted a song called Put Your Hands Up. But obviously, having two tracks with the same name on the one album was not an option, so her song was scrapped. Kylie worked with the Nervo Twins again in 2015 for their collaboration with Jake Shears and Nile Rogers, The Other Boys. The album's final track, Can't Beat The Feeling, which sounded like a follow-up to Love At First Sight, I think, had a number of writers on it including Richard X and Hannah Robinson. Speaking to the Such A Good Feeling podcast, Hannah said that despite it being a simple song, it was actually quite difficult to write and that there ended up being five different versions of it. It wasn't until Miss Minogue heard one of them and suggested trying popular verses that the song finally came together. Can't Beat The Feeling was said to be a possible single choice with remixes being commissioned. Sessions began for the album in spring 2009 and in the months that followed, Kylie began to worry that once again she was just collecting different songs from different producers and the end result would sound random and disconnected. Kylie's close friend Jake Shears, whose band The Scissor Sisters was working with Stuart Price at the time, encouraged Kylie to bring him on board to help tie the album together. Kylie, keen to avoid repeating the mistakes of X, heeded his advice and started working with Stuart Price in October 09. And soon thereafter, he was hired as the executive producer of the album. Stuart stipulated from the outset that there would be no more than 12 tracks and no ballads, well at least in the traditional sense, on the album. He agreed with Kylie not to just pick the best songs, but the ones which had a special significance to her, as he wanted the album to sound like a moment in time rather than just a collection of hits. Carly had also worked on the album with 2000s super producer Red One, who at the time was coming off the back of huge hits with Lady Gaga. In an interview with Attitude from 2010, Stewart had this to say about why Red One's songs were left off the album. This is no discredit to Red One, but Kylie is pretty assured in her special place in pop music heaven. And if it felt like she was chasing a sound that wasn't her own creation, she would become smaller than the sound of the record. Stewart did additional production work on the songs Kylie had already recorded to tie all of them together and make the record a cohesive one. Later in 2010, Kylie featured on a Tyro Cruise track, Higher. In a behind the scenes video of the making of the Higher video, Kylie said that the track had been considered for the Aphrodite album, but because it didn't fit with the rest of the record, it was decided not to include it. 
an unbelievably higher released at the end of 2010 was the last time up to and including the time of recording that Kylie made an appearance in the UK top 10 singles chart. And soon after the album's release, a track emerged online called Change Your Mind from the Aphrodite Sessions, which was presumably done with Dead Mouse. The song sampled a Dead Mouse track called Brazil's Second Edit, and that very sample will be taken by the production duo Stargate and used for the huge Alexis Jordan hit Happiness, also released in 2010. And now for a quick look at some of the album tracks. Everything is Beautiful, the only song on the album that might come close to being a ballad was of course written by Tim Rice Oxley from British group Keen and Fraser T. Smith who also wrote Adele Set Fire to the Rain around the same time which of course became a monster smash. Cupid Boy was also rumoured to be a single at one point with remixes being commissioned. The song was co-written by Swedish house mafia Sebastian and Grosso and two of the other writers on the track, Nick Clow and Luciana Caparasso, are also a married couple, making it three husband and wife songwriting duos on the record, which I thought was interesting. Album track Too Much was the only song from the album not included on the set list for the Aphrodite Le Follet's tour. Kyle's did include In My Arms, so that was probably enough Calvin Harris songs for one show. At one point it was rumoured to be a single and I think it would have been a much better choice than Better Than Today, a song I do like but just not as a single. The following year, Calvin wrote We Found Love for Rihanna and his EDM sound would go on to dominate the international charts and airwaves in the following years. Kylie did include it on her anti-tour set list though, so it did get its moment in the sun, sort of. Illusion and Looking for an Angel, the only Kylie co-writes on the album, both written with Stuart Price, were both subjected to Kylie's rigorous Dolly Parton test which consisted of Stuart playing the song on the guitar and Kylie singing it Dolly style to check if the tune was strong enough without any production, which sounds like the kind of quality control test every pop song should have to undergo. Aphrodite was of course accompanied by the Les Follies tour which was a huge success with both critics and fans and the underwhelming performance of the last two singles wasn't any reflection on the quality of Kylie's work more so the ageist industry she's a part of and the changing music marketplace at the time. With Aphrodite Kylie yet again scaled great heights and achieved another classic era. After the album's release a track emerged online called Change Change your mind. Oh, every pop song should have to undergo. Yes. Oh, finally. Kylie has had a number of great eras over her long and illustrious career. If you'd like to learn more about the making of these records, go check out this playlist. And if you got value from this video, don't forget to subscribe. Thanks for watching.